Russia has to think outside the box a little bit as far as I think so. is they, Yeah, they have to. They have to make an effort, not only to sell weapons as they've been doing, or but also to orient their economy and also their culture towards towards Asia. You cannot just simply do that by making a pronouncement and saying we are a Pacific country. But how about energy security? Uh, Russia perfectly mm -hmm. can fit into this. Uh, overall scheme. Sure, again, uh, energy is important, but that's only one dimension. You have to, to have an identity, and we're mm. talking about cultural identity here as a Pacific country. You must have culture, ideas, you have education, you have to have a subjective basis to it. You cannot simply say, because I sell weapons or oil, that I am an Asian or a Pacific country. So the cultural orientation, the demographic orientation uh, link, uh, all this have to, I mean the economic interdependence. Uh, in the United States is so heavily involved in Asia economically, American companies, American products, American culture, yeah. Hollywood. Uh, Russia has none of that. So, so Russia has to reorient. Unfortunately, what I see is that there are some strategic uh, statements that we are Asia, we have an interest in Asia. But Russia as a country, as a civilization still behaves as if it is part of the West. We have dis discussed uh, so far declining power, rising power, but from your experience, you have taught in Canada, there is the middle level power, yes. like Australia and Canada, we should not forget. In the future, this middle power can serve as balancing force in international political system or not? Well, I think uh, yes, but uh, I would qualify the term balancing. It's not going to be like a geopolitical balancing role mm -hmm. uh, that you side with one country to balance uh, uh, the uh, rising power. It's more like a uh, balancing in the sense of providing a middle ground. Middle ground. Being, yeah, being an honest broker, uh, being, uh, being a source of good ideas for a world order, a regional order. So I think uh, both Canada, Australia, and Australia have done that, and they'll continue to do so. But unfortunately, and since you mentioned my, uh, my links with Canada, I also have links with Australia. I was actually educated in Australia. Mm. Canada has fallen behind on this in the, in the recently. It used to be very active. Very in active in all these multilateral forums and, and you know RTP. this. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but now, I mean, the concern is that Canada hasn't paid much attention to this part of the world. And uh, it has uh, kind of disappeared from the multilateral game. What were the reason? Is it because of the domestic politics? Is it because of the change in people attitude? What? What are the main uh, reasons? I think domestic politics has a lot to do with it. Uh, the, the government that is uh, in power in Canada today has not valued its uh, relationship with the Asia Pacific and in its engagement with multilateral institutions in the same way as its predecessors. Mm -hmm. It's much more of an inward looking you know, nationalistic government. Uh, not sort of the internationalist middle power kind of role that Canada had projected. And also, um, Canada has done economically so well because of the resources, because of the oil and... Like Australia, yeah, like very uh, resource-based. Yeah. There's a big difference between Canada and Australia. Canada is next to the United States. So Canada doesn't need other countries to trade with other countries when it can export everything it has to the United States. Australia doesn't have that choice. So Australia has to have an international trading economic profile. And it's China, Southeast Asia, all these are Australia's market destination for Australian products or Australian resources. Canada doesn't need to export its oil or energy to anywhere else. It can just sell everything to the U.S. So because of the proximity to the U.S., because of this close dependence or interdependence between the U.S. and Canada, Canada doesn't have this sort of region, the necessity uh, to actually deal with Asia. That plus the ideology, the inward-looking nationalistic ideology of the current government sort of combines to create a kind of a gulf between Canada and Asia. But I sincerely hope that it will go away and Canada will return to this region as a middle power, as you said. You have written many books on regional security, international system. How do you see the regional architectures uh, in this region is emerging because of the involvement of United States and Russia in the East Asia Summit, which is uh, rather unique because ASEAN for the first time will set the agenda. How do you see this uh, development? I think it's a very positive development. I, I'm glad that the United States got into the East Asian Summit because what it does, it, it sort of extends the ASEAN principle of inclusiveness. 
So you know, ASEAN is not balancing, but it's including, in, uh, being inclusive. Bring all the relevant actors onto the table. Let them discuss, and the terms of the discussion are set by ASEAN. So I think it's a wonderful, good development. But having said that, you talk about the institutional architecture. Yes. We still have a bit of confusion about who is going to do what. Uh, I mean, what is the East Asian Summit going to do Correct. that the ARF cannot do? What, what is ASEAN the relevance defense, of APEC? Uh, yeah, what is the, yeah, what is the ADMM, ASEAN Defense Ministers Plus Plus? What is their role then? Uh, how is they going to? impact on the ASEAN Regional Forum, what's going to be to ASEAN. So we have a bit of institutional confusion. We have too many alphabet soups. Here. That's correct. Uh, too, too many alphabets in the soup. All together. Yeah. The other thing is also we need to move towards quality, not just okay. number. So we need to get institutions moving and working and doing things like conflict prevention or conflict resolution. It's not enough to just have institutions that promote dialogue. That's good, but uh, that's not enough. We have to have problem solving. We need to have confidence, uh, real confidence building. We need to have preventive diplomacy. And the institutions are not doing that yet. So we have still a long way to go. But how can ASEAN do that? Because ASEAN can hardly form a common position on issues that affect the global peace and security. I think ASEAN uh, cannot do it alone, but ASEAN is right in bringing all these countries into the discussion table. Uh, ASEAN must be prepared to concede some of the ground ah. to some of these countries. What way? In what way? You're talking about sovereignties or what? No, I mean, I, I think that's a, that's a tricky part. For example, um, if uh, ASEAN should not insist on being the leader of everything, uh, you know, it's okay to let other countries uh, to, to take the initiative and do things in their own way. Uh, rather than always come to ASEAN and hold all their meetings in ASEAN. So you have in mind that maybe certain meetings should be held in member yeah. country dialogue partners? Exactly. At the same time, I think some of the ARF meetings can be held. Intercessional? Yeah, inter mm -hmm. not only intercessional, I, I also ministerial meetings can be held outside. And also, even ASEAN can set an example of uh, doing its own conflict resolution doing its own preventive diplomacy. Something like, you know, what Indonesia is doing between Thailand and Cambodia over the previous temple, uh, mediating in a, a bilateral dispute. Facilitating. And facilitating. Yes. Well, yeah, the, you're right. Yes. It's, uh, it's facilitation good offices. That's right. But ASEAN should do more than that. ASEAN should do collective peacekeeping. ASEAN should have a mechanism, a uh, workable mechanism for dispute settlement. It has now a mechanism, but it's never used. Correct, correct. It's only for ASEAN Charter. Yes. So ASEAN should do all that. And once it sets an example, you'll find that all these other institutions that are based on the ASEAN model as the platform also start doing the same thing. I think that's, that's really the big so challenge. So ASEAN uh, has made progress. It's not, no longer a talk shop. I uh, never thought ASEAN was just a talk show. Uh, and also, by the way, in my way of looking at international relations, uh, to me, ideas and norms matter. And you cannot generate ideas and norms without talking. Uh, so, so ASEAN's role in creating a set of norms, set of uh, principles, uh, such as peaceful relations among states, maybe even non-intervention in the internal affairs that are destabilizing for uh, another country, uh, promoting cooperation, consensus. These are, these are the, the very important ways in which ASEAN can, uh, has made a contribution. But uh, ASEAN was a little bit uh, uh, behind when you compare to Mercosur of Latin America, to African unions. They have all the mechanism you mentioned. Also, you have to be very careful. If you look closely at Mercosur, the African Union, you also find problems there. No organization is perfect. I mean, basically, we're dealing with multilateral organizations. Now, multilateral organizations, by definition, are constrained uh, by, from you know, acting in a very decisive way. So even the European Union has problems when it comes to, like, for example, dealing with Russia, dealing with the economic crisis. Germany wants to do something. Uh, you know, Britain wants to do something else. We have to be always comparative in judging ASEAN's performance. That is not to say that ASEAN has done everything fantastically well mm. and should not do any, uh, should not strive to achieve better results. But uh, we should not also discount what ASEAN has done so far. But I think uh, ASEAN's main challenge now is to set up dispute settlement mechanisms, good offices mechanisms, and, uh, and uh, 
problem solving mechanisms and not just simply uh, remain as a forum for dialogue. So your verdict after all this discussion, the future world will be multipolarized with multi-stakeholderness, uh, holderism, and the decision making uh, spread out throughout the world. Uh, will be a much more secure world or full of uncertainties? Well, I can only hope for what the world would be. I mean, there's no way for me to predict, or I should not dare to predict what the world will look like. But on the question of uh, multipolarity, I mean, um, in, a, in a formal sense, yes, it can look multipolar, but multipolarity is kind of an obsolete concept. Mm. Uh, in a, because power itself, the nature of power is changing. Power is no longer military or economic power. So when you talk about multipolarity, you're talking about you know, how much economic and military power countries have. Now power is much more diffused and, and, and decentralized. There's information power. There's power of ideas. Mm -hmm. And so, so in that sense, what we're looking at is a world which is much more messy uh, and complex than a bipolar, multipolar, or, a, uh, or a unipolar. Uh, now, unipolarity is gone and will not be replaced of any kind. So what I think is going to, we're going to see is a sort of a world that is non-hegemonic, uh, meaning it's not a world dominated by either one power or yes. two powers, uh, collective or singular hegemony. A non-hegemonic wo world order, and I'm actually writing a book about this, um, it will have a few characteristics. One is that we should not aspire to be, uh, we should not expect to see everything like a universal order. The, there's going to be a lot of diversity in the world. Mm. Uh, we will see a lot of regional diversity, local diversity, cultural diversity, and we should embrace it. We should not think it's bad to have diversity. Uh, but then we should see what is shared and common among those diverse. You must have some feature of universalities then. Yeah, universality, some, but not kind of stifling singular universality, I see, I, I that one model is imposed on everybody that's else. Right. One size fits all. Yeah, that's what I, I don't okay. think is going to see. And quite frankly, I don't want to see it. Uh, I want, uh, you know, uh, countries, regions to maintain their autonomy uh, because it's more, it makes the world more interesting. interesting. At the same time, they'll be bound together by a set of ideas and principles which will allow them to interact and closely and, and, and develop cooperation. At the same time, power will become uh, diffuse and complex so that we don't have either singular or collective hegemony of one or several powers. Well, thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very uh, much, Gavi. Thank you very much. Nice talking for, to you. For, for joining the program. Thank you. Thank you. That's all the time we have. Our dialogue with Professor Amitav Acha. I hope you will follow our program again. Good night. สวัสดีครับ